Okay, we're in uh, 2 Corinthians 10 this evening, and we looked at this last week just in an introductory way and looked at verses 1 and 2 briefly. I'm going to review some of that. And then to look at this passage, this is one of the better known passages in 2 Corinthians. Um, And yet I find in my own life, uh, and as I hear other people using it, they tend to miss the main point of what the of what the passage is about, so we'll try to think that through uh, tonight a little bit. So let's read these first six verses of 2 Corinthians 10. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I whom humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I'm present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count in showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty, every lofty, <laughs> sorry, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So we noticed last week as we came into this passage that there's this abrupt change in Paul as he, uh, he changes tone very significantly. And he has a very specific issue in front of him at this part of the book. Up until this time, he's been dealing with the Corinthians as a whole and the issues that they'd had in their past. But in the interim somehow, and um, exactly when, we're not sure, but a group had invaded the church, and Paul's concern is with these false teachers. He doesn't begin by calling them false teachers, but that's clearly what he does think of them, and he will call them that, false brothers and false apostles, uh, as, as he moves into the discussion related to them. And uh, there, there are several things we should notice related to them. I'll follow my own notes here just a little bit so I've, I uh, say what I was wanting to say. One of the things that they are doing is promoting themselves and pushing forward themselves and their agenda by denigrating Paul. So it, it's clear that they have a motive behind their attack on Paul that is there. And their, their appeal is sort of on double side. Obviously, they are Jewish by background. Paul will make that very clear uh, before the chapter is over. Are they Jews? So am I, uh, and, and so forth. They are Jewish, and so for some of the people in Corinth, maybe those, remember the church had been divided. So there were some who said in, in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos, and others who said, I'm of Christ. Um, So some had been, Paul had planted the church, Apollos had come in later, and he was a gifted orator, gifted rhetorician. He had been trained in all of the the schools and the thinking when he came, uh, Priscilla and Aquila recognized his gifts, took him aside, instructed him at home, and he became a leader, and he's moved on but he left an impression in people who are very drawn to him. Others are Peter people. They call him Cephas, uh, Paul does in this. That's his Hebrew name. And probably these were part of the Jewish contingent especially. And then, then there's the Messiah party, and it's not clear who those were who were saying of they were of Christ. There's all kinds of guesses, but whatever they were. These people on one level appeal to the Jewish background, and they're clearly playing some Jewish legalistic things, and their theology is not entirely clear. Paul never really sets out what they're believing. But they're also uh, very impressed with Greek styles of rhetoric and Greek cultural values. So as we talked last week, there was this group known as the Sophists, and we'll see them as we go through here. Uh, And they were kind of traveling secular people And their whole style was they were traveling, wandering kind of philosophers. They would come on with their sophistry. Even the term has come to mean 
sort of people who love speculative kind of ideas, but they, sophistry, or the, the name sophists come from the word for wisdom, so they were proclaimed purveyors of wisdom, but they were also self-promoters because they came into town and they had to draw people around them, and they loved to boast, and they used the very Greek style of boasting and all of these other things. So what they have done at this particular point is come in and on one level they appeal to the instincts of the Jewish group, but they're also Hellenistic in their way to move into Greek culture and they appeal to many of the cultural values that are dominant in Corinth at that particular time. Uh, people describe them um, in a scholarly way as triumphalist in their view of the Christian life. In other words, their point is to talk about weak uh, power and strength and uh, victory and the come on with all the positive sides of the Christian faith. And it's very clear they, one of their main uh, criticisms of Paul is he's weak. Um, he, as it'll come up later, he worked rather than being sponsored by the people who were in the church. All of the things that Paul does are viewed as weak. They are viewed as the powerful and the affluent. And, and it's, it's a little bit like what we saw earlier about the prosperity of the gospel when they looked at it. They may not have used that language, but the idea that if you're a follower of Christ, you deserve the best, you get the best, and all of these things. And Paul was very different from that. So the attack on Paul centers on his persona. Um, he's not commanding. He's not a, a person in terms of his presence who has the kind of immediate charisma and yet, how do you plant churches and draw all these people together without having <laughs> some very special gifts going on? But he, he wasn't the kind that came into a room and, as the saying is, takes all the oxygen out just by his presence. I don't know whether you've ever been around somebody like that, but they walk into the room. My brother was talking, the, uh, the um, Prime Minister of Canada is having all kinds of troubles right now. He's... He's the you know, embodiment of a persona. And my brother talked about a time years ago before he was a candidate for that where he happened to sit at the same table with him at a dinner. And uh, he said, it's just amazing. The women just threw themselves at him in every kind of way. And he couldn't be in a, in a room without them. Pardon? No, they threw themselves at Justin, not at my brother. No. <laughs> He may have been jealous. I don't know what, what that's going on. Anyway, these were the kind of people who would have some of that kind of effect. And their attack on Paul, and it's there in verse 1, as we noticed last time, in this kind of veiled way. I, who am humble, sort of cringing in person, but powerful in letters. And they were using the way, you know, when Paul was here, he, he didn't confront some of the problems head on and stand up. He's kind of pulled away from that and didn't assert his authority. But then he comes and writes a letter and it's bold and it's confrontive. He's two-faced. He's a Uriah Heap in person, but uh, in, in his letters, he's Superman. Uh, and, and so that comes up again in verse 10, as we noticed last week, when they say um, his letters, pardon me, they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. Of no account, the, LSV, the ESV puts it, but it's stronger than that. It's, it's contemptible. Now, Paul was obviously a gifted speaker. I mean, he would go into a synagogue, open the scriptures, and people would be converted. And they would leave and all of those kind of things, but he didn't follow the style of the rhetoricians. He wasn't following that particular area. So the word boasting is going gonna, is gonna to come up in this, and Paul doesn't want to defend himself. The gospel is about Christ, not him. But if he doesn't defend himself against the charges, they will go by default. So he feels forced. And we're going to... Uh, we're, when we get into chapter 11, he'll use the word boasting over again, but he says, I, I feel like a fool boasting like this. One of the commentators says about it, and it's, it's a useful 
thing to get your uh, head around here. Circumstances have driven him to this uh, extremity. Boasting is clearly unwise. And, and the rest of the chapter will be all against, of chapter 10, will all be against commending yourself. Boasting is clearly unwise. But if he ignores the uh, slur of his rivals who have maligned him, the church will, uh, might be persuaded that they were on target. If he stoops to their level by boasting, he's a fool. But if he does not defend himself, he might lose the congregation to even greater fools. I like the way that's put. Um, if he boasts, he feels like a fool. This is not what a man of God does. But if he doesn't confront them head on, but his boasting will be, as we'll get to that point, his boasting is the kind of thing that you don't boast about. It's of the sufferings and the weaknesses and all of these other things. But he wants them to know he has the marks of a true apostle, which are seen not in triumphalism, but in the power of God working through his weakness. And that becomes a central part of, of what he wants to, to say to them. So let me just go back and quickly remind you of what we had in verses 1 and 2. Uh, he, what he basically wants to say is you've misjudged me. Uh, you don't understand. I am committed to ministering on the basis of the character of Christ. And so he has this reference uh, right at the beginning. I entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Uh, the word meekness, I, I still think the best picture for me of, of meekness is of a horse that submits to the bridle. Meekness is all about strength under control. They think it's weakness. Paul is saying it is strength harnessed to a higher purpose. And gentleness is related to the ability to overlook an offense and not to need to always win back in a particular way. And then he picks up this slur, I am cringing when face to face with you, but bold toward you. And in verse 2, he comes back in, uh, in effect to say, don't, don't push me. Because if I, I'm exhorting you, I want to be able to appeal to you. I don't want to have to command you. And I don't want to have to take out the rod and discipline you. I beg of you that when I'm present. So all of this section, verse, chapters 10 to 13, are all written with the fact he is going to physically return to Corinth. And he wants them to be ready for him when he comes, having dealt with these issues. Because if they, hasn't, if they haven't dealt with them ahead of time, he'll have to deal with them. And he comes on very strongly related to that. The boldness, the confidence that I count on showing some who suspect us, and the idea is more they accuse us of walking according to the flesh. Now, we ended there last time, but I want you to notice in this verse and in the next two verses, Paul uses the same word, but he uses it in three different ways. To walk according to the flesh, on one side, the flesh is unaided human ability in its weakness and its, and its rebellion against God. So that's a fairly common way Paul talks about the works of the flesh, and that's sinful nature in rebellion against God. But the flesh is also the human body and our, and our physical body and a sign of our weakness. And the flesh in another content is human, humanness without the enabling power of the spirit. So when they are saying he's walking according to the flesh, they're meaning it in that last sense. He's, he's lacking spiritual power, the kind of power that they thought about. He's walking according to unaided, we are the people of the Spirit. A capital P, capital S. We are demonstrating what it's like. It's the triumphalism. And so they are saying, Paul isn't anyone to worry about. He doesn't have the Spirit. We have the Spirit. So now he comes back in verse 3, and he's going to confront that head on. And so you'll notice he picks up that same idea of walking in the flesh. And he says, though we walk in the flesh, 
we do not wage war according to the flesh. So what he's saying on one level is we walk in the flesh. We live in the physical body. We live in human weakness. Um, but we don't wage war merely on the basis of human power and human abilities. And we don't wage it without the spirit. Our, the weapons of our for, warfare are mighty toward God. For the, and, and he talks about the various things that they do. I think the uh, NIV translates it and paraphrases all the way through here. It doesn't talk about according to the flesh. It says, we they, they accuse him of, of uh, what is it, uh, Jordan, walking in a worldly way. Yeah. Uh, so, all we, though we walk in the flesh, we don't make war in a worldly way. They're trying to paraphrase it. That's not the exact wording, but they're trying to make that point a little bit clearer. Now, I want to just stop here and just remind you because there's this is all a big word picture and from this point on Paul is using the picture of a Roman military attack on a walled city and the Romans would attack a, a city that's why all of the uh, the cities had walls in the ancient world not just because of Rome but uh, in all of the countries of that particular time and when the invader would come they could surround the city and they would put it under siege Inside each city, there was not only the walls, but there was a stronghold. It was the most secure area where the people inside would hole up and keep safe and secure. So if, if the walls were breached, they would go into the stronghold. And the invading army would come and they would have not only the soldiers surround the city, but they would have siege weapons weapons of their war. So they would have battering rams, they would have ladders to scale the walls, they would do all of these other kind of things. And Paul is coming here and he's using that picture of warfare uh, and he uses the picture, he's talking about the weapons they have to attack, in this case, is the fortresses and the ideas of these false teachers. So they are, as it were, a city under siege by the Apostle Paul. At least that's what he's going to say in this particular point. Now here's what I want you to see. Often this passage is applied on a personal level, and that is it is about a Christian taking captive his own thoughts. But that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking against coming against false teachers with their ideas and their, and their false values. Now, I have no doubt a Christian needs to take captive their own thoughts in some particular way, but Paul's picture is of God calling him to do warfare, ultimately. So that's what he's saying. If you don't deal with this problem, I'm going to come and I'm going to batter down <laughs> the defenses they put up, which are their false ideas and their false thoughts. We'll get there uh, as we go through this. And so he begins with this introductory statement. We walk in the flesh. Okay, we're human beings. And we uh, live as or, uh, ordinary human beings in that particular way. But we don't make warfare by the flesh. We walk in the flesh as humans, but we don't do warfare by the flesh. We do it by the weapons that God gives us, which he makes emphasis. They're God-given weapons, and they are powerful through God to do the work that God has given. Now, even though he doesn't say it, he is suggesting that all of these false teachers have to bring to the battle are worldly weapons. They're not divine weapons. And the worldly weapons are rhetoric, showmanship, power. Elsewhere he'll use guile and, to, and accuse them of the trickery of, of Satan and doing these kind of things. Uh, they're the kind of things that people bring to make on a good impression. And as you think about it in our... And, and also... Um, celebrity because they claim to have these letters of endorsement uh, from other places and they come all of these ways. And you think about the kind of things in our own culture and you begin to recognize 
that those are powerful weapons even today. People are taken in by personality, they're taken in by slickness, they're taken in by media use and all of these kind of things, showmanship. And Paul is saying that's not what we're bringing to the warfare. We're not bringing Greek cultural methods, we're not bringing Western cultural methods. We're bringing weapons that are given by God. And he doesn't describe them. I mean, he doesn't specifically say what they are, but they are God-given weapons. And for me, it's impossible not to think that his, the weapon that he brings most clearly to hand is, is God's word, is scripture, both from the Old Testament, what God has given, and also from the revelation that God has given to him, and apostolic truth. And another part of his weapon is prayer and, and trusting God. Another part is the fruit of the Spirit and the character that Christ has laid in him. And he's saying those things accomplish what only God can accomplish. They're mighty through God, not in and of themselves, but God empowers them, God enables them, and God uses them in this action that we're carrying out against these false teachers. So then he goes on to describe them a little bit further in this way. He says that they are siege weapons that will attack and destroy fortresses. So, first of all, he said they destroy strongholds. And these are the kind of uh, safe places where they think we're unreachable here. I mean, this is our basis. And I, I don't know. He doesn't say it specifically, but I can't help but think that in, in our biblical concept, these are the kind of deeply entrenched values, the uh, intellectual values, the moral values, the ethical values, the cultural values that dominate in a specific way. Um, for example, if you think of false teachers coming and, and making attack on the Christian faith and the stronghold, there's absolutely no doubt in the present time today that it's the it's the cultural ethos. I mean, how do, you, how do you explain how Christians who not very long ago would have found it absolutely unthinkable that you could defend same-sex marriage and homosexual activity are now capitulating toward that. Even so-called evangelicals uh, go down and saying, yeah, we've got to revise all of these kind of things. It is that because the power, apparently, of the secular world is so strong that they feel that they not need to back down in the presence of it. You think of other kinds of issues that in our society, or we back down because the culture says this particular thing, and science is the high priest, and that determines all kinds of things that go on. Paul is saying, God calls me to do attack on strongholds, and then he says, um, let me see how this is. The trouble is I tend to read this in my Greek text and don't come back to look at it. He says, uh, they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy, and the word here is reasonings. Uh, it's translated in the SV arguments because it comes out in that way. And ultimately, it almost has the idea of speculations that come. We destroy speculations. Um, because ultimately the world is based on speculations, not revelation. And Paul would come back and say, you know, what we come back with is revelation from God and God-given truth and insight. And every lofty thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. Most commentators think that he has something in view when he talks about every lofty thing that raises itself against the knowledge of God. Can you think of what might be behind every lofty thing that raises itself against God? Think the book of Genesis. A little bit later on, think a high thing that lifted up against God. God. 
the Tower of Babel becomes the kind of worldly symbol of human pride lifting itself up against the nature and character of God. And Paul is saying, our goal is, and our attention is, to take on those particular things, and God has given us the tools to demolish them. And the false teachers represent that in a, quote, Christian frame of reference. He's not thinking here about the world. He's thinking about these false teachers who are pressing in against the church, who come with these kind of things in the name of Christ, and uh, they are subtly eroding the nature of the gospel. And he's saying they cannot be tolerated. They must be resisted and attacked and demolished. And all you need to think back is even today, um, we talked about this last week, and I'm thankful that the United Methodist Church made the decision it did. It's on the issue of gender and sexuality. But that attack should have been made a lot further by Christians who should have drawn the line at the authority of the Bible and at the nature and person of Christ. And ultimately, they've made a good place to stop, but in some ways, it's way too late, and all kinds of people have been lost to the cause of, of, of Christ and the gospel, and so many churches have gone liberal as a result of that. So that's what he's calling for. And then he picks up the issue, and when you besiege a city... And when you uh, knock it down, uh, and then you go in and you attack the strongholds, what do you do? You take captives. And Paul now uh, says, and he shifts the imagery a little bit, but he is saying, we take captive every opinion raised against the knowledge of God and, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now his thought here is, that we take these false teachers and we bring them, or the false teachings, and we bring them to the authority of Christ, and they, they stand there to be corrected by him. They're not to be tolerated. They are to be taken captive and brought under bondage. And then the next picture is, and when you take captive people, then some of them are going to have to pay for their war crimes. So in verse 6, he says, being ready to publish, punish every disobedience once your obedience is complete. And that's a little bit curious way of saying it. But what he's saying to the Corinthians is, we can't demolish what's going on with these false teachers until you as a church repent and change direction. And when you've repented, then we can properly deal with them. But until you've repented of the false teaching that you've begun to absorb, we, we can't really deal with the false teachers. We can't expel them from the church because you're partnering with them and doing all of these kind of things. So what Paul is talking about here is a battle for the mind, a battle for truth, a battle for biblical truth and biblical doctrine. And he's really saying... In the Christian life, you cannot live better than you think. And if you have false teaching, you're ultimately going to live falsely. And so we need to bring thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Goal is then to think biblically and to have biblical truth at the center. Now, obviously, there's more of the Christian life than biblical orthodoxy, but there's never less. And biblical orthodoxy becomes the basis here of, of all of the other things, because they're, they're constantly going in these other directions. Their need is to deal with these false teachers, and they need to deal with them, because Paul will deal with them in the strongest ways when he comes. Okay, that's a lot of talking, but um, I just want you to see, on one level, this passage is not simply about, I need to take thought every captive to Christ. I may do, but Paul's thought here is false teachers, false teaching, and its effect on the church, and the responsibility of the church to be policing itself. Obviously, leaders have a special role. And you think of what Paul said to the, to the elders in, in uh, Acts chapter 20 in Ephesus, when he says, watch out from yourselves, because out of your own midst are going to come wolves who will begin to devour the flock. And there's this 
need to be kind of constantly on guard spiritually against what he's doing. So that's where he's beginning. Then he's going to go on in the rest of the chapter and he's going to begin to address these false teachers somewhat more directly, although he's never going to talk to them. He's always talking to the church. That is, the believers that he's convinced of. There's a minority of them who are being seduced away. There's the false teachers who are working hard to seduce them. And, and that's where he's going to go. Okay, so let me, having talked all that time, to see what observations you have, uh, what things occur to you as we walk through that, and just see what Paul is after here and where he's going. Bruce is the uh, mic man. Well, this was a good night. <clears throat> you completely turned around my understanding of that passage about holding every thought captive because I'd been taught incorrectly. Um, I also like the point that you made where the church needs to be responsible for policing itself and the leaders, which isn't happening as much as I think it should be today. Well, you know, I think, Gail, I, 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 don't, want, I, I don't think this passage is talking about every t taking every thought captive. But there is a biblical truth, and, and what I think of is Romans chapter 12, which says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So there is a process in which we need to be renewing our mind. But a lot of times this passage is, is taught in terms of sort of psychological. We have strongholds in our mind because of habits and back. We need to demolish the strongholds, and we need to take captive our thoughts because they're wandering and, and will betray us. Um, that's not Paul's point. There may be some truth there, but that's not what he's after. So. so I was trying to remember where the passage is, where the phrase that Paul uses, it's an insult if a believer behaves in a way that he's like a mere man. Is that in this passage? Because well, that's the it, flesh part. It, where it's in First Corinthians chapter three when he's talking about um, you're carnal, you're acting like mere, mere men. men. I mean, it's an insult. You're acting like somebody who's never been transformed. Who doesn't by the have spirit. the spirit of yeah, God right. living within him? Okay, so it's a pretty low blow. Yeah. Right. Gary, is there a uh, the the language? sounds a lot like spiritual warfare. You know, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. There, there seems to be a parallel there. Well, you know, and I didn't say it, and I should have, that behind these false teachers, he's later going to say, so even, even here, just to anticipate, he's going to say in chapter 11, verse 3, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his coming, by his cunning, your thoughts, there's the, again, will be led astray, um, sorry, uh, uh, from a sincere and, and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one uh, you accepted, you put up with it well enough. So clearly Paul is saying there, Satan works through deceiving. And interestingly, he compares the false teachers. How did the false teachers, pardon me, how did Eve de uh, deceive, how did the serpent deceive Eve? I'll get this right yet. The serpent deceived Eve by his words. And he's saying these false teachers are deceiving you by their words. So you begin to think wrongly and differently. So, but the serpent there is clearly anticipating Satan. And then in chapter uh, 12, he'll come on and say, you know, that these are, these false apostles are angels of Satan, messengers of Satan come in disguise. So, yeah, I'm behind the, the false teachers ultimately represent spiritual warfare in that sense because they are not just misguided men. They are satanic messengers in that particular way. And what they're after is another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. That's an interesting phrase we'll have to come back to when we get there. <clears throat>
Anything else that we should notice here? A little shorter tonight than usual, but none of you will complain too highly about that. I won't, Amy. <laughs> Gary, did you already mention if it's stated that Paul ever, I mean, if, if he went, that he said he was coming, if, if anything had changed? All we court. know is he went to Corinth, he took the money, and he went to Ephesus and then to Jerusalem. So you would think, and the fact that, um, in fact, the fact that we have this book of Second Corinthians means that Paul won in Corinth, because <laughs> they would have, if they followed the false teachers, they would not have kept first, you know, first, Cor first or Second Corinthians. But we don't have any any other evidence of it. Okay, um, well, let's spend some time praying together.